Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for finding the time to join us. Uh, my name is Romina Strati. I am UKRI Future Leaders Fellow at SOAS, School of History, Religious and Philosophies. Um, I'm actually based in Ethiopia, but I happen to be here this week and together with Lars, my colleague, uh, we're very, very pleased to be able to hold this roundtable event. Uh, we're very pleased to be able to do it both virtually and physically. Um, Lars is also the chair of the Center for Christianity. Uh, he has been uh, leading an excellent series of lectures in the past year, um, and I have been kind of joining for Ethiopia as much as I have been able to. Um, we, we, are, we are very glad to hold this roundtable event, which is really a culmination of a series of private uh, conversations or more informal conversations we have been having in the past year with colleagues from, well, not past year, but past few months, I'd say, uh, with colleagues from Estonia, UK, Ethiopia, Kenya, who are all concerned about what we see as an unsettling role that uh, you know, Orthodox uh, churches, whether Eastern or Oriental, are playing in current war politics in contexts that are as diverse as Ethiopia and Ukraine. As a way of background, just to position myself, I am a Moldovan by birth, uh, raised in Greece. So I happen to have family both in Ukraine and Russia, who are currently affected in various ways. Uh, but um, uh, I also personally happen to be based on working in Ethiopia for the past one year and a half since the conflict started. And I work with a lot of Ethiopian Orthodox um, affiliated institutions. So I've seen closely the convergence between religious and political discourse that underpins pro-war sentiment. Um, one prominent example is found in the case of a very well-known preacher who is advisor, social affairs advisor to the Prime Minister of Ethiopia. I want to say names, uh, and he's obviously uh, in favor of the war using religious discourse to justify it. Now, when the Ukraine crisis started, uh, I found it interesting to see some of the same dynamics play out in the context of the Russian, uh, Russian politics and the Ukraine crisis, obviously, despite the important differences, ecclesiological, historical, and sociocultural between Ethiopia and Ukraine. Not only is there a strong identification of political and church leadership in Russia that favors the war, seems to favor the war in Ukraine, but religious identity is also invoked as a distinctive characteristic of a Russian or Eastern identity that seems to be threatened by the encroachment of a Western secular modernity and the paraphernalia of it. The political events, as you know well, seem to have resulted in rifts and divisions between different Orthodox churches, whether Eastern or Oriental, in, in gen, endangering what we all seek uh, and, and uh, stand for, I believe, Orthodox unity, unity in the Orthodox world. Uh, both contexts ascribe to Orthodox Christian traditions, despite, again, important theological, ecclesial, and cultural differences. What historical events have informed or prompted the convergence of political and religious discourse in each context? How has Orthodox theology... Sorry, could you repeat that? Hello, Mom. <laughs> Mommy. I'm sorry. I got to have uh, my loves. I think uh, one of the participants. I'm sorry, I'm going to ask you. One second, yes, I'm going to see. You're going to ask me. Apologies, Thelma. I think that was you. <laughs> um, thank you for your contribution. I'll continue. Um, so both contexts ascribe. Did you yes, start with the first question that you posed? Yes, the I'm repeating that sentence. Thank you. So both contexts ascribe to Orthodox Christian traditions, despite important theological, ecclesial, and cultural differences. What historical events have informed or prompted the convergence of political and religious discourse in each context? How has Orthodox theology, one of self-sacrifice, love, and theosis, or achieving likeness with God in Amharic, the Ixiavi Heaven said, uh, lent itself to politics of war? What has been the role of church hierarchies in war politics? And do their positions reflect those of the laity and the clergy on the ground? How might we respond to rifts in the Orthodox churches when ethnicity or nationalism-oriented sentiments seem to prevail over a faith right, that should have no material boundaries and should make no exclusions or differentiations on the basis of material markers? This is a faith of unity. So Lars and I thought it appropriate and urgent uh, to have a reflective discussion on the relationship of Orthodox Christianity to war from both a theological perspective, but also informed by the different historical experiences of Ukraine 
Ethiopia, very diverse contexts. Today, we'll focus on the Ukraine crisis and the, uh, the Russian Orthodox context. And in a future round table, we will turn to look at the case of Ethiopia again, uh, in order to honor the differences between Oriental and Eastern Orthodox Christianities, but also the socio-political conditions in the two countries. And then we'll try to bring everything together and apply that more comparative lens. The aim of this is not only to deliberate on the relationship of Orthodox Christianity and war, but also to improve understanding among those who are perhaps less exposed or have less familiarity with what Eastern or Oriental Orthodox means. Uh, we'd like to nuance the conversations and representations in media outlets uh, and really use it for mutual education. So for those who are less familiar uh, with Russian Orthodox or Ethiopian Orthodox, respectively, to learn from each other. Uh, in parallel, we want either as scholars of Christianity or Orthodox practitioners ourselves, clergy or theologians, to reflect at this pivotal moment in human history, might there be a different way for resp uh, of responding to tensions and differences within the Orthodox world and beyond, one that is more in line with the synodical history of the Church when it was called to respond to collective challenges in the spirit of Soborimist, to use a Russian term, and one aligned with the phronema, the thinking of the church fathers and mothers venerated in this way. Now, in terms of structures, we plan uh, a number of presentations in the first hour and uh, about 10, 15 minutes for the presenters. And then in, we'll have a break and refresh, refreshments. Apologies to those joining virtually, no refreshments for you. And then in the second hour, we'll turn to the round table, hopefully around 40 minutes to have a conversation and anyone in the audience uh, can join along with the invited discussants who will join virtually. Um, uh, physically. Uh, so I'll now pass the word to Lars, uh, who will do the first presentation and start, um, and then we'll, Lars will introduce the next event. Thank you. Well, first of all, in the name of the uh, um, uh, center, the SOA Center for the um, for World Christianity, I would like to welcome you to this uh, round table, which comes at the end of a cycle of presentations, which started uh, last October. And uh, last year, when uh, last year in the summer, when um, Romina and I sat down in order to discuss the um, the theme for this year, um, it was um, well, Christianity a conflict, and um, or rather conflict resolution. And um, uh, that was, uh, of course, uh, several months before any conflict, uh, but the conflict in um, the Ukraine erupted into war. So it's, uh, uh, it's not a coincidence, but I think we would have uh, had um, the Russo-Ukrainian Russo conflict on the agenda anyway, in some form. But of course, now it's got uh, particular poignancy. Uh, now, Having welcomed you here to uh, the first uh, in-person uh, session in uh, three years, um, and you on um, uh, on Zoom, who I've seen several times for the uh, for, for the other uh, uh, presentations, for the other um, seminars that we've had, uh, I would like to uh, begin with a, a topic which I'm not actually an expert in, namely the history of the Orthodox Church and. Um, um, so do I know anything about uh, orthodoxy? Uh, yes, uh, via the medium of uh, uh, Christianity, which I think I know a little bit about, and uh, also uh, the medium of history, which uh, brings Russia into the center of my own studies a number of times. And Russia, I mean the historical Russia, so it's uh, the, the widest sense of the, the, the term. Um, and um, my own speciality in here at Sawas is the um, history of China. And here, the Russian church, the Orthodox church, comes in a number of times, uh, usually in the context of negotiating treaties. So this is when uh, the uh, bridge building, the conflict re resolving element of uh, uh, Russian Orthodoxy comes in. Um, if you have questions on this, because I've not mentioned this in my <laughs> little uh, outline, then please ask me later. So I'm going to take you back to the very beginnings, uh, not because um, I would like to fill the time, but because I think it's extremely important to uh, remember that the, the different churches are manifestations of the same uh, faith, the same belief. And uh, here you uh, could go back to um, uh, 
but the very first days, um, I just mentioned in one line that uh, you have uh, here from the, uh, the very beginning of the apostolic phase, so the 12 apostles and then later the 70 apostles who were appointed, um, a, a tendency to spread into those areas of the known world which were uh, inhabited by uh, believers of uh, the major, only monotheistic faith, namely Judaism, and those uh, cultures which had a number of other religious traditions, or uh, actually were uh, traditions of uh, agnosticism and atheism were being practiced. So uh, that, that is the world of the antiquity that we know. And uh, is this important? Yes, it is important. Why? Because, as you will see in a moment, uh, uh, Moscow, uh, Russia, sees itself as the inheritor of this uh, ancient world. And so everything that happens in this very early, just a uh, um, uh, uh, incipient period of Christianity is actually of relevance to Russian orthodoxy as well. Um, follow the process of the proliferation of the, um, uh, the, the, the word of God, and as opposed to the, uh, to the Quran, for example, uh, the, it is a text that can be translated. So it's actually, there is a translation, and this translation has the same sanctity as the original text. So it's been translated into the uh, lingua franca of the time, namely Greek. Not Latin, first Greek, because that's the eastern, uh, the eastern part of the Mediterranean. And here you have a very important fact, namely that the very centers of the urban centers that where you find the first uh, Christian converts, they are the ones who are geographically closest to the uh, Slavonic part of Europe that would later convert to Christianity. So from the very beginning, you can see a very strong imprint of the Greek uh, uh, Hellenic uh, uh, heritage of the, uh, of, of the ancient world. Having said this, uh, the uh, Christian church, also the Christian uh, faith, also spreads into the uh, eastern parts of Africa. It spreads over the whole of Africa, but um, uh, also uh, in terms of uh, concentration of uh, the clerical, ecclesiastical um, uh, history is Eastern corner that is important. And here, especially the Roman province of Egypt, where you have a uh, center, that's Alexandria, uh, which then becomes the seat of the first uh, bishop. And this development of uh, an early Christian church then leads to the um, you will see that later, to the creation of uh, an Orthodox church. So this is the, the Coptic church. So if we speak about Orthodoxy, it is not just Russian Orthodoxy or Eastern European Orthodoxy. We have this very strong tradition in, um, in Egypt and then, of course, also in Ethiopia. So this is the, um, this is, I'm going to speed up. So this, otherwise it will take a long time. So uh, then this you will be familiar with. These are the persecutions. And even at the height of the persecution, you can see that already 10% of the population are Christians. This includes Northern Africa. And here we have the first schism. So in a nutshell, I want to say the history of the early church, the first 1000 years is one of schisms. So it is nothing that would uh, become a hallmark of the later historical period. It's from the very beginning, you have uh, branches of the church that uh, distinguish themselves in theological terms or in terms of earthly authority. So whose bishop shall we listen to? And you will see some examples, but I actually omitted most of them. Um, and in this long period of the uh, uh, Pax Constantina, the, peace, uh, the relatively peaceful proliferation of Christianity under Constantine, um, which again is being uh, uh, very much um, uh, re referred to looking back at this imagined route of uh, Orthodox Christianity. Uh, they can see that you have a major shift, a uh, major schism that occurs. Arianism. Arianism, I uh, spent a whole year um, studying. So it's, um, uh, there is, uh, it goes how, uh, what uh, deeply, Differing interpretations of the Christian faith people can have 
at this early stage in history. Um, Ethiopia, turns up here in this corner at the very beginning. So you can see that the, uh, the core of Christianity, the core lands of Eastern Christianity is already deeply impregnated with the, um, with the Christian message and the structures of a church, which uh, starts to um, develop. Um, Constantine then names Byzantium, Constantinople, after himself, very modestly, and uh, this is then dedicated to Theodokos, the mother of God, which in itself would then lead to another schism. So here we have um, Constantinople. Uh, you can see this is airbrushed. The minarets are taken away, but it's just to give you a, this is not with a political message, it's just to give you an idea what it, uh, what it probably looked, and probably these are also added later, but it's this dome structure, the, um, the uh, basilica that you find also in, in Rome, in the west of Rome, so, and, um, and of course it's uh, it, literally a city between east and west. It's in the center of the Hellenic world still, although uh, Seljuks uh, are arriving. So this is a part of a, a world which is changing. With the Hagia Sophia, the same um, knowledge. So uh, we have, yes, wisdom. Wisdom. yes, wisdom. So we have, we have here a, um, uh, a, a merger of uh, the Christian sainthood and uh, Greek philosophy. So this is a very uh, uh, poignant term. So, um, the next sequence I entitled, uh, I titled uh, True Christianity, that's of course the, the term uh, the, 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 that you find in Russian for orthodoxy, um, in the third Rome, that is, the second Rome is Constantinople, I have five minutes, the third Rome is, um, uh, is going to be Moscow, and I, these elements you can find in, uh, if, you're, uh, if you're very much interested in early uh, uh, Christianity, again, I uh, point to the schisms which it, it, it develop and which um, leads to the development of autocephalous churches. These autocephalous churches, these churches which is with their own heads, uh, uh, literally, um, they, they become a hallmark of uh, the Eastern churches, namely that they have their own patriarchs who uh, give directions to their faith put in here, um, yes, yes, so this is important because from this time onwards, the Eastern Church has its own uh, uh, laws. Um, so, but once this is, this canonical law is in, uh, in, in place, there is actually a, a rule book for the development of the Orthodox Church. This is important, not so much because it's a battle, but uh, to show that 15 years after the age of you have uh, already uh, the, uh, a, a world which looks very different uh, on, on the map, namely that you have Islam on the map, uh, Islam on the, the same page as Christianity. And this would be, until today, the, the, uh, the pattern that would form, that you have Islam and Christianity as, as, as two neighboring houses or as, as, as brother and sister um, who, who don't always get on, but who live side by side. And then I leave out the third one, which is, of course, Judaism, who have a home in both of these until at least in the 20th century. Uh, this one, you, you get some pictures, like the entertainment, but this is the conversion of the Eastern Slavs to Rus, and there we find a, um, a very interesting depiction that you get um, here in Ivan um, Sergei Ivanov's um, um, Patriotic painting of the late 19th century, which becomes a hallmark of the uh, of uh, Russian um, uh, patriotism, uh, namely the connection with Christianity. So this is uh, something. Uh, it's the conversion of the pagans. Uh, I think it's it's titled. But uh, importantly, this is the. Um, uh, it, it goes to show that the idea, the very concept of Russia, is uh, is one with Christianity, although, of course, the pre-Christian roots go back further in history. And we have Russia, the Russia of the time, and you can see that it looks suspiciously like Ukraine. It is actually almost completely on the territory, yes, Ukraine. And um, so uh, you have um, Estonia up here, so you have a, um, 
uh, Moscow far away. So uh, th this is the, uh, the earliest part, uh, which uh, of course is being created out of the, um, uh, the, the Slavic Nordic um, kingdoms that uh, are, are being formed during this time. And from the very beginning, we see the importance of Kiev. Kiev as the, um, the founding place of Christianity in, China, in, um, uh, in Russia. Uh, it is, this actually is related to the, con uh, to the conflict. Two minutes. Uh, next. <laughs> and this uh, key events in the history of uh, uh, Christianity in, in Russia, namely the conversion of Olga, as before, and then afterwards, uh, uh, Vladimir, or um, who uh, you saw earlier on in the uh, 19th century picture, Mongol rule over Russia, and then Alexander Nevsky, who's uh, seated in Novgorod as a prince and who actually keeps the northern part of Christian. And um, here, uh, some of the most important uh, facts, namely that we have a, an autocephalous church which is actually truly established in, uh, existed before from, from the end of the uh, Mongol uh, Empire onwards, but uh, uh, from 15, so from around 1600 onwards, uh, very firmly. Um, uh, united with the idea of the uh, of the Tsar, and there you get this Kesar uh, Papism, so Tsar, so Tsar, it's the same term, that you have essentially a union between the church and the state. And um, what Peter the Great introduces is the single church, where the Tsar has even more freedom to appoint it, although but ironically, it takes the, the uh, cue from um, the, the Protestant movement that, that you get in, um, in Central Europe and uh, Western Europe at the time. Um, next step would be, I put the question mark here, classification of the Tsarist Empire through the Orthodox Church. That's not, and I don't just mean Europe, I also mean uh, Eastern Asia. Um, uh, I put the big question mark behind this. Uh, the period of the uh, Soviet Union, is uh, completely uh, uh, transformed through the Second World War when Stalin not just allows but actually encourages the uh, creation of a, uh, a patriotic church, if you like, in order to encourage the population to resist the invasion by the Nazis. And, but the uh, roots of the um, Bolsheviks in the, uh, as a, an atheist party lead to the creation of a, a church that is outside uh, a Russian church that is outside um, Russia itself, and that's the uh, the other abbreviations of it too. And of course, that leads this. Where are we here? This this term and the uh, the, the, the synodal uh, definition, although the church itself has changed, uh, leads to the, um, the situation where we're in to, today. And then, uh, just very quickly to remind you that um, uh, this church in Russia is not the only uh, Orthodox Church, and in fact, not the only Orthodox Church that could say that it's a Russian Orthodox Church. So you have you have offshoots in uh, all uh, all of Eastern Europe, and then uh, of course, including Georgia as well. So you have uh, Georgia is a very important one, Bulgaria as well. So you have um, uh, these are ch churches with uh, whom the um, uh, the Church of Russia has very uh, uh, tightly aligned alliances. And then there are others, last one, yes, which uh, have, where, where I put the, um, uh, the I, I couldn't think of a better adjective, right? <laughs> so disputed. And uh, where, where you have, um, uh, where, where you have, um, due to political changes in recent history, um, a, um, a, 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 not, not just a theological doubt, but actually um, a, a um, a certain degree of enmity between the, the churches. So, so much for now. If you want to ask me about the details, please ask me later. Thank you. Thank you. Well, uh, without any further delay, I am going to stop this by here. Stop share, sharing. Um, excellent. And then make sure that the camera is on the presenter. I believe that you can, the people who are watching us virtually can see the presenters. Yeah, excellent. Um, thank you so much, Lars. So the whole point, I believe, of Lars's presentation has been to uh, 
put this in a historical framework, essentially, especially for those who are less familiar with Orthodox Eastern Christianity uh, more generally. Um, I also have very few notes before we move to the speakers who are extremely more knowledgeable than we are, um, but just a few thoughts really to provoke questions and reflections for, for uh, the, pres the presenters uh, with some challenging thoughts and then the round table to set the, the, the framework for the discussions. Um, so I am a religious scholar, a religious ethnographer, apologies, and a practitioner, an orthodox practitioner myself. Um, so my reflections really are informed by those identities. I'm not a uh, orthodox theologian uh, or a member of the clergy. Um, so evidently, what I will offer is a very rough delineation because, as you as you saw, is very context specific when we talk about orthodox traditions. There, there there's various differences. Um, but I'd like to offer a rough delineation and really suggest some directions uh, on how we might think or question or problematize the current relationship between Orthodox Christianity and work. Um, for those who have, so, I, so my reflections are uh, primarily from what this, well, what this theology is about and what the theology tells us, um, and then what this theology has translated into when it comes to lived reality, uh, since I'm a re religious ethnographer and a practitioner, and then how we can uh, integrate those frameworks, these multidimensional levels of religious experience into our analysis today. Um, so orthodoxy, for those who have little familiarity, pertains to the upright, to the correct, ortho, faith or belief, doxa, orthodoxia, which was revealed to the disciples of Christ at Pentecost. Part of this faith has been preserved in written form through the Holy Scriptures. However, in Orthodox tradition, the unwritten holy tradition, which was perpetuated through the life of the church and embodied in the experience of the saints, has been equally important and complementary to the written revelations. The holy scriptures validate the importance of the holy tradition, while the holy tradition confirms and reinforces the revelations of the holy scriptures. This holy tradition has been preserved in its essence as inherited by Christ and his disciples and includes the teachings of the Orthodox Church fathers and mothers, um, the synodical decisions of the church councils as accepted by different churches and other elements that have defined the liturgical life of the ancient Orthodox churches. At the core of this holy tradition is the soteriological aim of the Orthodox faith to heal the corruption, corruption of the human nature that was incurred following the disobedience of the first fashion couple and their expulsion from heaven. In the Orthodox Church, the faithful aim to achieve likeness with God and salvation by achieving uninterrupted communion with God, participating in the sacraments and living a life of Orthodox ascesis, practice. Following St. Maximus the Confessor, this therapeutic pathway in Amharic Methanit um, has been de described as purification, enlightenment, and hypnosis. As the faithful undergoes purification, she or he begins to be enlightened and to obtain insight into divine mysteries. This awakening of the news to the grace and wisdom of God is what the Orthodox tradition has identified with noetic theology. In other words, theology in this tradition has not been predicated on reason or intellect, but rather on the alignment of the news. The Orthodox, Orthodox Church not only has a distinct ancient theology, but has historically acted with a missionary spirit, engaging cautiously with pre-existing social and political systems with the aim to transcend them and to consolidate the Christian message among new converts. Sociocultural, economic, and political realities specific to the histories of what have been historically Orthodox societies mediated all the ways in which theology was pronounced and explained by church hierarchies and communicated by the clergy to the laity, but also the extent to which the faithful could, em could embody the Orthodox worldview in their everyday life. For example, regarding the historically Russian Orthodox population, Elizabeth Gassim has observed the following, quote, although these cultures may be considered traditionally Orthodox, given the modern history of these lands, which includes domination by Islamic and communist forces that often did not allow the church to educate its children fully, one may question how deeply an Orthodox ethos has penetrated such societies, close quote. It should be recognized also that the traditional prominence of the Orthodox Church in these societies deemed religious discourse acceptable to appropriation by different parties for political, sociocultural, and other vested interests, contributing to further distortions. Still, 
Such discursive deployments need to be differentiated from the historical experience-based orthodox phronema or way of thinking and living, which the church fathers and mothers embodied, who are the true saints and theologians of the orthodox faith. These discursive deployments should also be differentiated from the lived experiences of the faith, who may have an incomplete understanding of theological matters and may also be distanced uh, from a life in the church. However, may identify themselves as orthodox, as it happens with a large percentage of Russian Orthodox belief believers in Russia. What one needs to recognize is that in many traditional oriented societies organized around a major religious tradition, most vernacular practices, the lived experience of the community, the culture of the community, will be inevitably framed in religious terms. These terms may or may not emerge from a complete theological understanding, but may be inherited from generation to generation as a deeply valued tradition integral to one's identity. This is how I was raised from my parents who came out of the Soviet Union knowing very little about the Orthodox faith, but yet valued very much. One of the tendencies that we have seen in media since the outbreak of the Ukraine war is for the positions of the Moscow Patriarchate or Patriarchate to be taken as representative of the whole body of clergy, or to be given exclusive primacy as an influential ideological force in shaping current thinking and sentiments in the country. These representations seem to assume that the religious leadership in Moscow has substantive power over political decisions, and that where this decision to change, a disposition to change, events could take a different direction. Other representations consider the religious hierarchy to be completely enslaved to political interests. Most analyses of this nature have paid limited attention to the complex and nuanced realities that have defined the church-state relations in Russia since the end of the monarchy, during Soviet times and the post-Soviet era. Neither has been the Russian Orthodox Church in Russia without any political agency and influence, nor has it been unrestricted by state powers and interest. The appropriation of orthodoxy by state or political interest is not a new phenomenon, nor one that has not been debated intensely within Russia itself. It is well known, for example, that Orthodox Christian identity has been integral in the conception and the evolution of Russian nationalist imaginary. On the topic, Zoe Knox has written, quote, many Russian nationalists regard orthodoxy as providing the only basis for post-Soviet social and political order. Tismanyanu identifies one feature of national chauvinism as apocalyptic salvationism, by which he means the resistance to alien forms through indigenous traditions. In the Russian context, this is drawn from Orthodox Messianism, one of the central features of the link between Orthodoxy and nationalism in Russia. Close quote. It is also well known that a large percentage of Ukrainians identify as Orthodox and consider this integral to their ident national identity as well. It would then seem opposite to ask, how have different visions of state building in Russia and Ukraine in post-Soviet times conversed with Orthodoxy? And can the effects be seen in current war-related politics? What has been the influence of such discourses in Russian and Ukrainian society, but also in the wider Eastern European region? And I know that Eastern Europe is also a big More importantly, it begs asking, do the positions expressed by the patriarch or the church leadership have primacy over the clergy and the laity on the ground, especially those who have been critical of the positions of the Moscow patriarch, patriarchy even prior to the current crisis? Many parameters will mediate not least being how the laity and clergy are processing the current political realities, whether they are interpreting them through a spiritual lens. Oftentimes within Orthodox lived experience, the faithful are more likely to be influenced or guided by spiritual elders, saints' words of prophecies around world-changing events, and their own spiritual fathers and mothers, uh, nuns and monasteries. The opinions and positions of these diverse actors have not been captured sufficiently in current discussions. By, but might be central in understanding wider sentiments and responses of the community of the faithful, not only in Russia, but also in, in Ukraine and in neighboring states. So what can we say about the relationship of Orthodox Christianity to work? Obviously, there's not one answer to that. That is very context specific, and it has to be grounded in specific histories um, and, 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 and theological traditions. But it can be agreed, I would say, that the Orthodox faith takes a clear position against the use of violence, teaching its faithful to love their enemies. As reflected based in the Old Testament law, the Orthodox teaching is undoubtedly against murder. In parallel, it is also understood within the faith that one should protect oneself when their life or the life of the loved ones is being threatened. Thus, the Orthodox Church has blessed what may be described as defensive and just wars historically. 
Emperor Constantine's vision of the cross prior to the battle against Maxentius is commemorated and well known among Orthodox believers. And there are numerous instances in the history of what have been historically Orthodox societies when priests took up arms to fight against invaders and external threats to protect their motherlands, their communities, and their churches and monasteries. Even in the event of defensive wars, when citizens are called to pick up arms to protect themselves and their families, the Orthodox faith neither teaches nor celebrates violence. It can be noted, for example, that the Queen is Sixth Council of the Orthodox Church ratified two canons by St. Days of the Great, one of which includes rules on excommunication for those who murdered in times of war attacks. It's questionable how the church applied those rules, but, but that exists. In the history of the Orthodox Church, many soldiers of a strong faith chose martyrdom instead of using their military skills to fight. These military men are venerated as saints precisely because of having chosen to sacrifice their lives rather than take the life of another, even that of a non-Christian. Theologically speaking, the Orthodox faith considers that only God, understood as being love himself and having only signs, can bring perfect justice in the world. The faithful may believe that using violence to stop what is perceived to be a wrongdoing will bring justice. But the faith would argue that the enemy of humanity and his servants will find ways to use the opportunity to foster more evil doing. The Orthodox faith aspires to the cultivation of a humble awareness among the faithful of their own imperfections and limitations as sin prone human beings and asks them to show love and understanding for others if they want God to understand them and to forgive them. This is not to suggest that Orthodox believers should not strive towards social justice, but to stress that this should be guided by an Orthodox conscience, the phronema of the church fathers and mothers, with compassion and concern for humanity, avoiding the use of violence, understanding that violence will only be at violence. I find it opposite to conclude this very rough contouring of Orthodox theology and the relationship to work by echoing the words of one of the church's most enlightened hierarchs, St. John Chrysostom. Quote, for such is our work, it does not render the living ones lifeless, but leads the lifeless ones into life, filled with tameness and much leniency. My habit is to be persecuted and not to persecute, to be fought and not to fight. Thank you. Thank you so much. So I'll, I'll pass the word to the next speaker, Father Tikhon Vasiliev. Yes. Um, Please take a seat. <laughs> so Father Tichin uh, is born in St. Petersburg, um, lived many years in a monastery in eastern Ukraine, uh, Donetsk region, before he completed his uh, DPhil in modern theology at Oxford. Uh, his current research project concerns the perception of orthodox and nationalism in Russia and Ukraine. Uh, and you are joining us from the University of Oxford, correct, Father? Well, uh, <laughs> I had a point that I to the University of Oxford. I've got uh, a couple of days ago graduated from the Oh, congratulations! <laughs> congratulations, yes. Very well. So now uh, I'm one of the with the Russian Christian Academy of Humanities to be in Russia in St. Petersburg. Excellent. So, would you like me to pull out some? Would you like me to prepare it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You'd like to start, I'll prepare it too. Okay. No need to. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So I was asked to share with you um, some um, reflections on the topic of our round table from a strict ecclesiastical point of view, more valid experience. And indeed, um, I researched at Oxford slightly different topic. I wrote my thesis about angels um, rather than um, such um, um, rather than political theology. Um, and so my presentation is not um, exhausted in any sense. I just want to um, point, uh, to perhaps mention some directions of trends. Uh, and I would like to go to our times and precisely to um, the 
current crisis in um, Ukraine and um, the war um, and the um, situation um, which found themselves in both the Russian Orthodox Church in the um, Orthodox Church in Ukraine. So I would love to I would like to mention for your attention to three um, points to add first. This is about um, ideology, which is widely now discussed and uh, argued uh, um, in all sorts of um, you know, documents, declarations, articles, analytics as the ideology which is behind the, this um, crisis, um, which is also called Russian world ideology, Ruski Mir. And um, it's, um, it's, well, in one probably the most uh, well-known declaration against it, published on the uh, Wars Academy, Theological Academy, and uh, public orthodoxy and elsewhere, signed by hundreds or even many thousands of intellectuals, uh, orthodox uh, intellectuals, against this uh, Russian world ideology. Um, when you look at this document, you would imagine that um, the Russian Orthodox Church is um, the only um, pillar of that ideology, which, uh, in my opinion, is not true. And um, in order to, well, you, uh, yeah, you see now the website of um, Izborsk Club, the club of Izborsk, which is probably the main think tank in Russia, um, which basically created, uh, well, the members, the permanent members of this club basically are the creators of and proponents, the main proponents of this ideology. And just, just um, let me, um, how can I just share it? I'll give it to you. I'm sharing the link with you. Ah, you're sharing. Yes, because yes. I can't see the yeah. yes. Okay, so thank you. So now, the, uh, um, the permanent members. So I, I, I was able to find the website of this uh, organization in any uh, other language that are other than Russian. So that's, uh, you can see this um, there. Also, the, um, this uh, website gives you know, the portals. Um, there is nothing secret uh, about this. Well, um, maybe they have some sort of uh, not uh, public meetings, but uh, the members, the permanent members of this club are um, on this web page. And just uh, quickly going through the, those names, um, to pay your attention to, there are uh, two uh, bishops, uh, Metropolitan Tikhon, uh, my namesake, and Shifkunov, who is, uh, of course, one of the, if not the um, most influential bishops in the Russian Orthodox Church, uh, but you won't find, you will not find the patriarch, but, but he uh, and another bishop, there is bishop, um, um, bishop, what's his name? Um, well, there's another bishop, Bishop Augustine, Augustine Anisiko, two bishops, no clergy, yeah? Um, and the bishop um, Deacon is said to be like a confident, confident or but he is indeed very close to the authorities and to Putin himself. Um, but among the me permanent members, you also see this man, Alpir Kurganov, who is, um, well, I uh, won't say you, uh, who is the head of uh, Muslims, as it were, the committees of different Muslims in Russia. So basically, it's a sort of like a, um, the, uh, may were the head of Muslims as well. Uh, well, he is among the permanent, uh, one of the permanent members of this club. So, uh, who are the other generals? Um, well, writers, the uh, and um, governors, uh, uh, members of parliament. Um, very influential um, film directors, um, philosophers, 
um, I don't know all of them, uh, professors, uh, intellectuals, uh, media people, journalists. Um, 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 <laughs> well, the one of my is a priest, as it were, a priest actor, or uh, a suspended priest, who was well, that sort of a media person, one of the sort of social, social, um, and uh, Nikolai Starikov, well, it's an interesting figure, um, probably not very well known outside Russia, um, an author, uh, and well, the main proponent, I would call him, of Stalinism. I was basically the main defender of Stalin, uh, Joseph Stalin. So he published like uh, I don't know, maybe dozens of books uh, explaining, as it were, you know, uh, and um, showing that Stalin is not the monster that this he was created, but rather by somebody else. Bonus, and he is sort of very nice and very um, good person who whose main um, uh, 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 um, is a um, contributor to the uh, Russian state. So this is a very important um, person right here. So Stalinism, all sorts of um, Russian, um, what you call nationalism, of course, so there are some of them, those, for example, Prakhanov, so, uh, Russian nationalism, her excellence, uh, uh, a writer. And uh, many other people whom I would love also to say. There are some, well, Joras Alfiorov, an uh, academic, was a very famous, one of the first rank uh, Russian scientists, uh, member of Russian Academy of Sciences, uh, hard science. Yeah, so uh, uh, he is now, um, he died. And he was uh, just to, um, wanted to draw your attention that he was an open atheist and a very pronounced atheist. Uh, opposing, you know, any sort of religiosity in Russia as well, the race of the rise. So, and he is, uh, was the member, the permanent member of this, of this club. And, well, you see somewhat Italian. And so on. Um, so, mm, the, the main thought, perhaps, the main idea which I wanted to say that um, there are many components, not just Russian Orthodox. Russian Orthodox is important, but not the only pinnacle. And uh, in the church and um, Orthodoxy uh, becomes in, um, uh, indeed enslaved in, in instrument, uh, it features the instrumentalization of religion. Um, and the main feature of these ideologies is strong statehood. That's, uh, you know, what, what, what you know, it's all of them. They all support strong statehood, the imperial, uh, present imperial past and future of Russia. So that's the main feature of this ideology. So Russian Orthodox Church uh, and this particular conflict, there are several um, levels of engagement in the conflict. Has already been mentioned by um, Romina that, uh, of course, the first level is or the most visible level is the bishops, the chair, and uh, another level less um, discussed, the level of monastics uh, and uh, but it's and, and spiritual fathers, and their authority is very high in, in certain situations. I would say, well, comparable to the authority of the bishops in the Orthodox Church. Uh, and it's less uh, visible outside the church, but you very well um, know it being a member of church. For example, I received like you know a huge amount of messages from all sorts of people, you know, saying that well, well this elder said that, and that elder said that, and that. So all sorts of um, opinions and uh, which were expressed by those monastic leaders. Um, it's indeed important to know what they say. Um, the other level, uh, next, like the third level, is parish clergy. Parish clergy. Well, they have also authority, but it's much more limited. And uh, if you compare it with the authority of the monasteries, some, uh, you know, the monasteries are some sort of opinions which are expressed by monastic leaders. Sometimes, you know, they can 
they, they can spread all over the church basically very easily because we have one office. Office for the whole of uh, the bottom of the It's important to kind of get them to overestimate it. And the lowest level, but still um, sometimes uh, overlooked, is the uh, level of lay people. And who are those Orthodox lay people? You know, uh, in Moscow, for example, there is a uh, Svetinsk monastery, some other monasteries mo uh, inside Moscow, um, and some monks and uh, priests live there. And who are the, those the lay people who come there? Some of them are the members of the government, the ministers, and so they could be. Uh, and some of them are, you know, church goers. Right? So, the, of course, among the lay people are all sorts of, um, uh, all sorts of people. So, that, but this is the, um, the, the church probably, um, it's not always, um, voiceless and non-influential, I, I, I wanted to say. So sometimes those lay people are very influential in, in their opinions and they um, are heard uh, within the church as well. Uh, some say some of the oligarchs are uh, lay persons, but they uh, eat the agenda sometimes. So uh, ideologically, there are some points and some aspirations of the Orthodox people, um, which those people who created the ideology, they draw on, on those points. And those points are monarchy as a political ideal. Um, it's very popular among the um, Orthodox people. East-West opposition. You know, this opposition, again, it's um, something which is sort of widely um, accepted in the Orthodox circles and even, you know, among the intellectuals, because it's sort of expressed uh, theologically by such a uh, big conversions from Father George Florovsky, one of the Western, uh, one of those theologians in the West, but still, um, he um, and endorsed very much this. Um, um, uh, this way of perception um, of the world. Um, the other point would be conspiracy theories or masons, all sorts of um, other things. And um, another point would be traditional uh, family and so-called traditional values. Another important point, which is very important and widely accepted by all the Orthodox and all the other, well, I mentioned that monarchy, east-west position, um, some conspiracy theories where traditional family, all those um, ideological uh, points, um, they are um, very widely accepted by the majority of the Orthodox people who are both bishops and clergy and lay people and monastics, of course. And those points are precisely those um, points which were um, taken by those creators of this um, ideology. Yeah? So the uh, permanent members of, the, of that of the club. Uh, but, you know, and these are points which you would find also probably support uh, from the uh, Muslims are they, um, and, and so not only Orthodox people. So uh, maybe I'll say a few more words later only about the Ukrainian Orthodox Church, uh, which is also important. See it as a um, see a potential to talk about the reconciliation. So there's the potential in Orthodox, there is potential for reconciliation in Ukraine. Our final speaker, and we're going to reverse the dynamics of the speakers online digitally. So those who are joining us virtually will be able to listen to your apologies for the audio. Um, so the next speaker is Father Thiani, uh, Father Evangelist Thiani, a very good friend, friend and colleague uh, joining us from Kenya, actually. Um, Father Thiani is um, a married senior priest, proto-presbyter uh, of the Greek Orthodox Patriarchate of Alexandria. 
He is a senior lecturer at the Makarios III Orthodox Patriarchal Seminary in Nairobi County, Kenya, and Bishop uh, Gafuna Theological Institute in Kiambu County, Kenya, where he teaches and publishes on practical theology and development studies. Uh, Father, the uh, Father Evangelos Tiani will give us a, a different perspective coming from all the way of uh, Orthodox Africa. Father Tiani, very good to have you here. Please speak loudly. I'll put the volume uh, the highest it can be, and hopefully we'll all hear you. So thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Romina, and thank you very much to all of you. Christ is risen to everybody, uh, and uh, I'm really glad to be here and to highlight a few things here and there. Unfortunately, they're not very good things <laughs> to discuss, uh, but uh, we'll try our best to make them uh, look nice, uh, even though they're, they're, they're they are, they are kind of tormenting us at the moment. Uh, so the Greek Orthodox Patriarchate of Alexandria, North Africa, is uh, the second and uh, second ranked autocephalous Orthodox Church globally. It prides itself as having formed, uh, being formed by its first patriarch, that is uh, <clears throat> Mark the Evangelist, uh, who served uh, this see from around 42 to 63 AD. Originally, this church. Uh, uh, governed Eastern North Africa, uh, that is uh, the contemporary countries of Egypt, Libya, Tunisia, uh, Sudan, Eritrea, and Ethiopia mainly. Uh, Sub-Saharan Africa was only given uh, officially and demarcated uh, as part of the Patriarchate of Alexandria in 1921 by Patriarch Meletius Metaxakis, who is a very interesting uh, figure in the Orthodox Church history because he was once a bishop in Cyprus, uh, the Archbishop of, uh, of Greece, uh, the Patriarch of Constantinople, and the Patriarch of Alexandria. So he was uh, quite a moving Patriarch. And uh, that's the reason that the Greek Orthodox Patriarchate today calls it itself the Greek Orthodox Patriarchate of Alexandria, which is the ancient uh, term and then adds and all Africa from 1921. Uh, since then, um, this church has grown, especially um, from the 19, um, uh, the same period of 1920s when the Patriarchate of uh, Alexandria got a, a major contribution of um, uh, Africans from the Eastern uh, part of Africa joining uh, the Greek Orthodox Church, not because uh, there was uh, any missionary who came to East Africa, but because the Africans themselves became uh, their own missionaries, uh, looking and searching for the ancient uh, uh, Christianity, and uh, from there joined the, the Greek Orthodox Patriarchate of Alexandria. At the moment, the Patriarchate has about 60 hierarchs and 50 dioceses. Um, in November uh, of 2019, one senior clergyman of the Church of Kenya wrote to the Patriarchate of Moscow, asking them to take the task of initiating a local mission church in Africa, uh, like uh, exists uh, elsewhere in Europe, in America, in Asia, in uh, Australia, where we have um, uh, parallel Orthodox jurisdictions in those areas. So this priest wrote to the Patriarch of Moscow, and he highlighted a few issues that would make it possible uh, for the Church of Moscow to get a large following that would help start uh, the Russian Orthodox Church in Africa. And not from scratch, but uh, from existing clergy and laity and the parishes of the Alexandrian Church. Uh, so he gave them uh, very good uh, ideas. And um, then the liturgical celebration of the Pope uh, and Patriarch of Alexandria, the, the other was the second, who is the current Patriarch of our church in Africa. He celebrated with Metropolitan Epiphany uh, uh, Dumeko, uh, who is the Kievan um, uh, uh, bishop uh, who was considered as schismatic. And he did that in August of 2019. Uh, uh, and that, um, that actually helped uh, this agenda of, of uh, invading Africa, even Andrea formally, was always uh, on the side of the Church of Moscow. And all of a sudden, uh, actually in 2018, the fall of 2018, he was uh, in Odessa. And he celebrated with Metropolitan Onifuri, who is under the Patriarchate of Moscow. And... Uh, everything was okay. And he was uh, telling uh, Epiphany and his group to join the Church of uh, Russia. All of a sudden, now he goes and celebrates uh, with, the, with the enemy. 
and he says a different thing than he used uh, to. And so this drove the invasion agenda even further. So the Church of Moscow invaded Africa uh, on 29th of uh, December, 2021, when they established uh, two dioceses of the Church of Russia in Africa, the North African uh, Church and, uh, in Cairo and a Southern African Church in Johannesburg. But then they only installed one bishop, <clears throat> Uh, Metropolitan um, Leonard, uh, who became the exarch of Africa, and uh, he's uh, now currently uh, the bishop commemorated uh, by the African uh, uh, clergy and the parishes that are under the Church of Moscow at the moment. Now they cut around, uh, they got around 100 priests and parishes in Africa. But at the moment, most of these uh, priests, uh, we can say they have remained with about 60. About 40 of them have gone back uh, to, their, uh, to, their, to their bishops and to, to the patriarchate, but the rest are still with the, with the patriarchate of Moscow. Now, why did the Church of Moscow invade Africa? According to the Church of Moscow, they invaded Alexandria because of this celebration of the patriarch of Alexandria with the Ukrainian schismatic group. Therefore, for them, the Church of Alexandria then became schismatic by celebrating with, a, with group, a group that had been separated from the main church, and therefore they kind of separated themselves automatically. That, uh, therefore, um, this uh, 2019 declaration of Constantinople, which also the, Patriarch, uh, the Patriarchate of Alexandria kind of joined in, brought the, these uh, people who joined uh, this schismatic group to be schismatic. What about according to the Church of Alexandria? According to the Church of Alexandria, Alexandria joined Constantinople in accepting the autocephaly of Ukraine. That's one of the reasons that uh, Moscow kind of invaded Africa. Number two, according to Alexandria, Putin, has economic expansion politics in Africa, which leads, uh, which now he uses the Church of Moscow uh, to come and uh, from there utilize this uh, eventually uh, to, to, to take on the territory of uh, Alexandria. Number two, three is uh, for them, the Church of uh, Russia always wanted to initiate a mission church in Africa but they were not able to do so because of the, the canons, uh, because this is, uh, you can't start a parallel jurisdiction in another uh, parallel, in another ju uh, canonical jurisdiction. But according to the Africans, uh, those under the, ch uh, the Church of Russia, uh, the Church of Russia came uh, to, to, to assist uh, the, the African uh, uh, priests to, to, to be saved from joining the schismatic group and two, uh, from the Greek tyrants who are, who are complicating their life by, by uh, noted, uh, Romina, not, noted. Um, the Church of, um, of, of Russia came to assist them and to help them. And uh, then according to the priests and, and uh, lay people who are under the Alexandrian church, Russia, um, uh, it, it is the reason that the Church of Moscow uh, came uh, to, to, to invade Africa was one, uh, because of the Russian and the Western countries' politics and propaganda that seeks to maintain uh, the former allies uh, that inter, um, intact. Uh, for example, the Church of Alexandria was always uh, uh, an ally of the Church of Moscow on anything that the Church of Moscow was saying, whether it was uh, local politics, whether it was national politics, the Church of Alexandria was always on that side. Now they have gone to the other extreme side. So in wanting to, to push them back to come and join them, they are doing this. Number two, destroying the Church of Alexandria until they go back to being their allies uh, is also going to help if there would be um, a pan-Orthodox uh, meeting because uh, the Church of Moscow would need more allies on their side. So they are pushing Alexandria, they are destroying their church, uh, they are creating challenges in, within their church so that the Church of Moscow then can have allies where, when a pan-Orthodox uh, vote would be called. Another one is to threaten other churches that want to join Constantinople in their decision on the independence of the Ukrainian church. Now, those are the Alexandrian African churches. But, but what is the impact of the Church of Moscow uh, in Africa? On faith questions, the place of the Orthodox church in war and crisis, and the prophetic voice of the church is now 
very shaky and questioned highly by our lay people in Africa. They do not understand how Orthodox bishops, how Orthodox priests can not speak about people being killed, about people being displaced in their homes. How can they still pray about peace when there is no peace? Our people keep questioning this and they have a problem with this. Some of them don't even want to come to church. So this is affecting us in a big way. Number two, on the unity of the clergy and laity in the national churches, as well as the parishes, there is a lot of hatred and foul language among the priests and lay people. You can even see this on social media. You can see this on Facebook, on Twitter. Our clergy and lay people keep abusing each other. You're on this side, you're on that side. Something we had not seen before. Administration-wise, the confusion of who is in charge of the church administration glory, how ecclesial challenges and grievances are, are, are resolved, this is a major problem. About the inter-Orthodox relations, a lot of Orthodox churches now are either you are with Russia or you are with Constantinople. It's not about Christ anymore. And our people keep asking, who is leading who? Canonically, we have two parallel canonical churches in Africa. This is something very new to us. We never had this kind of situation before. Now it is there. How are we going to deal with it? It's a problem. The clergy needs official transfers to join another church. Now the clergy are giving themselves transfers. We, are, we, have, a, we have a problem because those clergy, if they want to leave Moscow, they won't ask for transfers. They never got transfers to go there. Where would they have that? What about some other clergy? The enmity between the clergy and their hierarchs. The, we have many court cases, for example, part of Kenya. We have many priests in court with their bishops and with their lay people. People are fighting who will serve in this church, who is going to come to this church. The loss of clergy in some diocese. If you go to, to, to Antananarivo, uh, where join the church of Moscow, the parishes, they have nobody to take care of them. They, they are closed, they are shut some positive things. The clergy who had grievances against the Greek bishops and they joined the Russian church, they are very happy because they are listened to. Their challenges have been resolved. Some of them needed money. Our, our, our priests don't have money. The, 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 uh, the, the Russian uh, government is giving us money to give to those priests. So they are very excited. They have salaries. I don't have a salary I'm under the Greek churches. They have salaries. So this is an improvement of their life. It's a very good thing uh, for them. There, there is direct involvement of the Church of Moscow to the parishes in Africa, which never happened before. They were always passing through the Patriarchate. Now it's very direct. Uh, so there are, there are some things that are very good, some things that are, are, are terrible. At the same, uh, in conclusion, what would I say? What lesson can we learn from this invasion or, and schism in Africa? There need to be a better way of the Patriarchate of Alexandria to handle administrative grievances, as well as uh, the life of the clergy to be taken care of. Because most of the clergy who left, left because they had grievances that were unresolved. Two, because of payment of the salaries of the clergy. The Alexandria Patriarchate was not doing that. They need to think about this. Another thing is the patriarch is still very highly powerful because even the synod did not make this decision. It was the patriarch who made the decision uh, of uh, joining one or the other side. So the, the synod also will need to do a few things. But uh, the, the reality is the grievances of the clergy and the parishioners should be handled in real time and there should be found a way. There, are, there is also need for more African bishops who will contextualize the issues that are happening in Africa. That will help more. But finally, Moscow at the moment invaded Africa where no other local church ever did so. So we expect there will be even more complications because other churches, if this is the way to go, other churches will still come in. So we hope that the chaos and the enmities that exist at the moment may come to an end by a canonical solution found on all of this. But at the moment, Africa is suffering because of the Ukrainian issue uh, that is only because of the Ukrainian and Moscow issue. We are so far away from them 
but yet we are suffering in real time and this may go on for decades and decades. Thank you. You did amazing, Amara, for the very little time that I gave you. Thank you so much for your contribution. Uh, we'll take a break now and then we'll come back after about um, 10 minutes. So we'll give ourselves 10 minutes for refreshments on our side for you. If you can grab something in your kitchens, wherever you are, and, and just, uh, you know, just leave, stay in the meeting. You can close uh, your cameras and just be, be here because we'll start, we'll start on time in 10 minutes exactly, okay? And then we'll come, we can take questions as well. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, I mean, I can start if uh, no one else wants to go first. Uh, so, thank you. Welcome. Hello. Uh, thank you for having me. So I, I'm Nathaniel Wood. Um, I, I'm speaking as a, a constructive theologian here. Um, so I have to admit, uh, I did have a little trouble hearing some of the presentations. So I don't know that I can interact with, with them as much as uh, I would have liked to, unfortunately. Um, but uh, to speak to some of the questions that uh, Romina had, had posed to us, uh, the discussants when she invited us um, uh, on this topic of orthodoxy and war. Um, uh, one of the questions that we were asked to uh, comment on uh, was this question of whether orthodoxy uh, which is a religion that's supposed to be focused on uh, self-sacrifice and love um, uh, is capable has the the kind of resources to respond to uh, these problems of war that are caused by uh, issues of, of nationalism. Um, and one of the the things that came to mind uh, when I uh, thought about this question, um, uh, is particularly this idea of self-sacrifice and love uh, within orthodoxy. And I think speaking from a theological perspective, um, if we're gonna talk about orthodoxy as a religion of self-sacrifice and love, uh, then we need to do that in a way that starts with the idea of Christ's self-sacrifice uh, on the cross. Uh, and particularly for orthodoxy, they need to do a better job of developing, I think, a theology of the cross in response to uh, the ongoing war right now. Um, and, and I'm thinking about this particularly in relation to the type of theology of the cross that was developed um, mainly in Protestant theology after World War II, um, right? So there's this development of this so-called uh, post-Holocaust theology or theology after Auschwitz as the, the German theologian Jürgen Moltmann called it, um, where the, the focus of theological attention turned squarely to the, you know, God's self-sacrifice as the one nailed to the cross. Um, in terms of orthodoxy's resources, I think uh, in general, orthodox theology hasn't um, focused on the theology of the cross in general nearly enough in its history compared to the Western confessions of, of Christianity. Because um, orthodoxy's uh, theory of salvation has tended to focus on theosis um, and incarnation, and has tended to focus on the resurrection as triumph over death. But uh, compared to the Western theology, the, the, the focus on the cross has been, uh, I, th I think, underemphasized, and especially that tragic element of uh, the cross. Um, so that, you know, in the Protestant post-Holocaust theology, um, the cross became uh, the starting point for these more critical 
political theologies um, that were criticizing these so-called theologies of glory, um, right? So they were specifically focused on developing these new kind of political thought theologies that were critical of earthly powers uh, that were victimizing people, um, not only in the Holocaust uh, as what prompted it, but also uh, in other situations of, of political oppression. So it's critical of these earthly powers and focusing on God's solidarity uh, with those who are suffering. Um, so, uh, you know, what I thought of immediately with this question was uh, the need for orthodoxy, I think, in light of the Ukrainian situation to develop some kind of post-Ukraine theology that would be somewhat analogous to um, to that earlier Protestant post-Holocaust theology. So uh, a theology that like that tradition that is focusing more squarely on the cross as, um, as this example of God's solidarity with the suffering and a critique of earthly powers. Um, because you know, the real problem um, that animates a lot of the, the wars that orthodoxy has found itself entangled in, and including this current war, um, is orthodox political theology's tendency to focus on um, the doctrine of theosis uh, and the idea of earthly kingdoms as um, somehow participating in and mirroring or imaging the kingdom of heaven on earth. Uh, and that has caused it to become too complacent and too um, unwilling to critique uh, earthly powers. And um, so I think this, my hope, I think, I guess, would be to say that the experience of Ukraine would be this sort of catalyst for this thinking, this theology of the cross, the post post-Ukraine theology that would focus more on this, uh, this critical element. Um, I mean, I know a lot of uh, Orthodox theologians have been you know, talking for a long time now about the need of Orthodoxy to criticize nationalism and to criticize um, these various doctrines that tie the church too closely to empire. Um, I think uh, the theology of the cross is a an opportunity to do that. So um, yeah, I guess that's that was my initial thought on this question. Thank you so much. And I should have said that you are Associate Director of the Orthodox Christian Studies Center of Fort Ham University. Uh, so thank you so much for bringing awareness to the crisis and the role of religion obviously in this as a center. Uh, thank you so much. Is, um, is anyone, does anyone want to follow after this without me forcing you? Any, any of the discussants? Otherwise, I'll just start calling names. I, I could uh, um, maybe express um, my um, uh, appreciation of what uh, Nathaniel has said. Uh, uh, I think there is a, a real need for the reflection, theological reflection uh, on the part of Orthodox theologians on um, the way in which uh, the kind of the whole kind of development of the, the, the theology after the Second World War in the West uh, has uh, been unnoticed by, by, by Orthodox theologians. And, and there is a real need to um, um, open up to the uh, theology after Auschwitz, theology um, after the Second World War uh, that has been um, uh, pursued by um, um, Western theologians and in particular German theologians and the need to translate these works um, and to um, study this experience. So, yeah, so I, I would support that. And um, uh, I would also um, mention other uh, points that there is, you know, a, a need for reflection and, you know, looking at the, um, Kind of anthropology and, and generally, like you know, Christian humanism that has been 
again, you know, um, not very well developed uh, um, in, in the Orthodox theology. And uh, so the, uh, the problem of, 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 of the human subject, you know, that has been um, neglected. And uh, so I think, uh, you know, there is on the one hand a need to kind of look at uh, what has been done in the Western theology, but on the other hand to look at the resources that Orthodox theology has and uh, uh, its own resources and maybe um, <clears throat> to understand, you know, what, what is there uh, that we can uh, learn from. Yes, so this is something I, 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 I wanted to mention in, in, in response to, to Nathaniel and um, I personally myself like try to pursue the theology of peace and understand like what, what could be um, resources for this and uh, it, it seems that there is uh, still again uh, lots of um, confusing terms, you know, what it means, you know, to, you know, what does peace means, you know you know, what uh, the Moscow church uses as a just piece. And I think uh, um, we could um, reflect on that, like what it means, you know, to, to have just uh, peace. And uh, what, uh, where is the place of, of um, the Christian uh, pacifism, you know, how, um, so there are all these kind of um, issues that been, um, raised by some peace activists and there are several many of them well i wouldn't say there are lots of them but there are some of them but it seems that their voice is has not been uh, heard so it's um, very um uh, very important work but we, we don't really learn much about um, what they're doing from the kind of mainstream um uh discussions so to say and uh, yeah, so this is something I, I wanted to, to say, but let's let's continue. And I think there will be um, maybe more opportunity for me to um, intervene later on. Thank you so much, Irina. And I should say you're at the University of Tartu in Estonia. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Thank you for joining us. Uh, anyone else would like to go next? I think Alison. Alison, please. Yeah. And we have Andre, yes. <laughs> so Alison and Andre. And then Elizabeth. Well, Alison, that's that complicates matters. I don't want to never complicate matters. Okay. Okay. Yes, that's that. Yes, Alison, please go yeah. ahead. So Alison, just as a, as a way of introduction, uh, is a research fellow in church history at the Department of Theology and Religious Studies, University of Tartu, Estonia. And she has been actively involved in choir directing prison ministry and youth work in the Russian Orthodox Church. So Alison, the floor is yours. Yeah. Um, I'd like to kind of perhaps just take us down to the level, kind of grassroots level of, of Russia itself, which is where I am. Um, and I'd like in particular to just say a word about uh, my involvement in youth work, or perhaps I could say my lack of involvement uh, in recent years, owing to the way it's, I've seen it being carried out in the area where I am. Um, I mean, I'd like to tie this in with what Nathalia, Nathaniel has said about the, you know, the um, kind of need for a critique of the theology of, of kind of glory or of, um, the kind of glorification of, of war and um, a need for a critique of earthly powers, because uh, um, this in a way is exactly what I'm, I'm not seeing here. And I, I'd just like to give a, a kind of concrete example um i mean many people have asked me during the war well you know what, what are actually people thinking on the ground and they're they're asking you know why aren't people reacting why aren't people saying anything and obviously there are some people who um you know who are against the war and i i would say that an awful lot of people here are kind of not exactly indifferent, but they're just kind of getting on with their lives, trying to kind of make sense of the, the sanctions and things like that. Um, but I would say that within the church itself, there is a, this very strong uh, strain of, um, I would say, the way that the, the kind of Russian world viewpoint is being transmitted to young people. Um, for example, where, where we are here, um, the, the kind of summer camp of the young people is run by an organization which is called Gorlitsa, 
uh, which means dove. So again, this kind of, um, I mean, Irina has mentioned that, you know, what does peace mean? So in a way, this, this camp is kind of put across as teaching the young people, um, you know, the ways of peace. But in fact, if you actually look at the, the aims of what they do during this camp, um, you know, the, the primary aim is, is love of the fatherland. Um, I mean, I, I have no kind of, you know, no problem really with, you know, teaching young people to respect their country and to be responsible citizens of their country. But, um, you know, that, that is very much the top aim. I mean, I was just looking today on the, uh, the website of uh, a nearby diocese to us here and the way they explain the camp. I mean, the aims are love for the fatherland then it's strengthening in the Orthodox faith is the next aim. The next aim is, is knowledge of kind of military kind of practice and regulations from the spiritual point of view. Um, and the last aim is the development of personal qualities. Um, the way that the camps are carried out is that for a week, um, the young people, this is starting from the age of 11 upwards, uh, are kind of divided into two armies. And basically in the course of the week, they're kind of fighting each other in these armies. And the, the girls are being um, uh, kind of nurses. And I mean, some of them are taking part in the actual battle as well. You know, a lot of it takes place at night. So, I mean, I can see it's very kind of appealing to young people. Um, I mean, this is all kind of interspersed with, you know, singing, which is very kind of patriotic. It's about Holy Rus. Um, then there are talks, um, which again, are, I mean, it says here about the people who created, uh, who created the fatherland. And in the list, it gives Suvorov, Kutuzov, you know, Alexander Nevsky, Dmitry Zanskoy. Um, you know, and, um, I mean, I, I actually left the, uh, the youth work of our diocese, kind of resigned from my, my work doing this, uh, you know, simply because I, I couldn't go along with this kind of uh, way of bringing up uh, young people. Um, and I, I suppose my, I, you know, I, I, I would like to ask some questions actually of uh, those who are here. I mean, I, I wanted to ask a question of Irina or at least ask her to, um, to comment, I mean, she's involved in a school in Estonia, and I'm wondering how you kind of negotiate uh, national identity. I mean, in a, in a kind of Russian Estonian context where the children are Orthodox as well, and they're being raised in the Orthodox faith. But I mean, I think it's a, a similar. I, I'd like to ask the question of you know anybody who's a parent here or anybody who's an Orthodox believer, if this kind of uh, bringing up children you know it's not going to lead to um a kind of a generation that is not i mean basically not able to make a critique of earthly powers because they're exact you know they're being taught the exact opposite here and that they're being taught it that this is part of their christian faith as well so um yeah anyway i've said enough um yeah I, i'd be interested to hear people's comments Alison, so before Irina has an opportunity to answer, which we'd like to hear, uh, can I just have Andre contribute and then Elizabeth and Father Dragos? <laughs> Thank you, Father. And then we'll, Irina will come back, so we'll have the second round, okay? Is that okay? And I've made a note of, the, of your question, Alison. Um, so Andre, may I, may I invite you? So Andre Shishkiv is a research fellow at the School of Theology and Religious Studies of uh, the University of Tartu, ex-secretary of the Biblical and Theological Commission of the Russian Orthodox Church. He's a theologian specialized in political theology and ecclesiology. Andre, the floor is yours. Welcome. Uh, thank you, Ramina. Uh, I, uh, I would like to draw an attention to uh, another um, aspect of uh, our uh, discussion uh, or maybe uh, another approach uh, to, to our discussion. Um, uh, for several decades, at least since uh, 60s, uh, theologians of various denominations uh, have been saying that theology must be contextual. It cannot be uh, uh, seen in isolation from specific circumstances and must not be detached uh, from practice. Uh, the same concept in different contexts uh, can be understood quite differently and lead uh, to different practical consequences. 
the danger of uh, universal declarations urbi et orbi lies precisely in uh, forgetting the context of the events to which they are addressed. Uh, solidarity as an option for the poor and struggling works only in the context. This seems uh, to have become uh, commonplace, but uh, Christian leaders and theologians continue to make the mistake of forgetting uh, the context. I would like to show uh, one example to make uh, my idea clear, uh, such as the case uh, with the notion of uh, fratricidal uh, war or Keynes sin. Uh, in relation to, uh, to Russia's uh, military aggression against Ukraine, which uh, many Christian leaders uh, have already used uh, in their speeches and statements, among them Pope Francis, Archbishop uh, Opedaphoros of America, theologians who signed the Oxford uh, statements, uh, uh, statement against the Russian world uh, doctrine and others. Uh, of course, uh, they uh, relied most likely uh, on the rhetorical cliches uh, such as uh, all Christians are brothers or all men are children of uh, God and uh, in what way uh, any war is uh, fratricidal. However, uh, the problem uh, here uh, is that the phrase um, fratricidal war uh, in the Ukrainian context is closely linked to uh, Russian uh, uh, state and church propaganda, which seeks to present Ukrainians as a subetnas uh, within the Russian nation. This is the essence of the doctrine of uh, the Russian world, um, which was created and developed by uh, Patriarch Kirill, uh, but not the members of the Izbars club, uh, who are marginals in their majority. Uh, in other words, uh, fratricidal war is a propaganda cliche uh, that reflects uh, the imperialist vision of the Russian state uh, and the church leadership. Uh, Father Kirill uh, Gavarun wrote about it uh, two years ago, and I found uh, the citation, uh, I quote, uh, the word fratricide from the Russian point of view therefore implies people uh, of the same nationality. Uh, this euphemism became a synonym uh, for civil war and uh, is propagated uh, by the Kremlin through the Russian media. Um, uh, Havarun uh, criticized uh, Pope Francis, who is uh, his uh, opinion called the war in Ukraine by a term uh, from the vocabulary of Russian propaganda, fratricide. Uh, the phrase uh, fratricidal war after uh, 24th February uh, was first used by uh, Metropolitan Anufri, head of the uh, Ukrainian Orthodox Church of the Moscow Patri Patriarchate. Uh, he seems to be a Ukrainian, but uh, let's not forget the, what rhetoric of uh, the uh, Ukrainian Orthodox Church of Moscow Patriarchate leadership used before the February invasion of, uh, in, in Ukraine. Uh, sometimes it repeat, uh, repeated uh, Russian propaganda formulas. Uh, that is how the rhetorical vocabulary of uh, the Ukrainian Church of Moscow Patriarchate was formed. In a critical situation, uh, Metropolitan Anufri didn't find in his vocabulary anything better than uh, the well-established uh, the year's propaganda cliche. Uh, it was later repeated by the Senate of the uh, Ukrainian Church and uh, now we see that the, he and the Senate of the Ukrainian Church of Moscow Patriarchate still uh, didn't uh, uh, and their communion with Patriarch Kirill, who several times made publicly signs uh, of support of the war. In comparison, the heads of the uh, Autocephalus uh, Orthodox Church of Ukraine and Ukrainian Greek Catholics uh, said nothing about uh, fratricidal war. Obviously, uh, the universal statements of Christian leaders and uh, theologians about Ukraine now require contextual verification by Ukrainian theology. And to do this, uh, Ukrainian uh, theologians, primarily those currently uh, uh, in Ukraine, need to be involved in working on them. Ukrainian academic uh, theology is one of the most developed in uh, Eastern Europe, uh, much more developed than uh, Russian, for example. And I'm surprised uh, uh, at their neglect by Western theologians. Uh, during uh, this war, I uh, know uh, only one person among the Christian leaders and the intellectuals of the first role uh, who publicly said the, about the necessity 
uh, first to hear Ukrainians, to be really contextual. Uh, this was Rowan Williams, former Archbishop of Canterbury. Uh, that's why uh, I think that uh, we need uh, not uh, um, only uh, post-Ukrainian, uh, as uh, Nathan uh, said, uh, theology, but uh, contextual uh, theology uh, based uh, on the uh, on the uh, view of uh, Ukrainian theologians. Thank you. Thank you so much, Andrei. Applauding yeah. here. Um, I would like to, Elizabeth, would you like to go next and see if uh, you on the other side can hear Elizabeth? Otherwise, we. Do I, do I come up? To... Would you like to? Yes. <laughs> You can come up so that you can hear better, yes. Elizabeth. So, Elizabeth, why don't you come here? And then we'll have Father Travis uh, Eresco. Apologies, Father. Wait, if Father Drago. No, 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 no. Please, please, Elizabeth. Uh, it's good to have this interaction and alternation. Yeah. Um, so, you, you speak straight and with a loud voice, and I can uh, change the camera. So they will start seeing as well. Right. Yeah, fine. Yes. Um, I, thank you very much. Um, I, I'm I'm coming at this from rather a different angle from most of you, uh, being you know no no nowhere near the the countries that are directly affected, but indirectly affected because of the way that the churches in the so-called diaspora are all tied into the various patriarchates. And I think this one thing this highlights is what an enormous problem that is, because you know, one, one can accept that, yes, in, in principle, um, you know, we, we, we should love our enemies, we should uh, abstain from violence, or even if necessary, bearing violence under whatever circumstances. I mean, that is that is the Christ-like way. But in practice, you know, we can all recognize that in a conflict, this becomes vastly more difficult. There is so much less excuse uh, for those of us at a safe distance to be engaging in the same tribalism and tragically that's what happens and it seemed to me you know i was interested in the the, the first speakers who were talking about the need for new theological approaches because i'm not saying categorically that's not necessary but it, it, it certainly isn't the first thing that occurs to me it, it seems that so many of the resources are there, even in terms of models. Uh, you know, some, someone was talking about the, uh, no, I, I, I haven't got those uh, notes, but I mean, a sort of triumphalistic approach to church and state. But I mean, within the, within the Russian tradition, you have, for instance, uh, the tradition of, of passion bearers, saints. Uh, you know, people considered saints specifically for non-violence. Examples like that are there. Uh, we're not we're not paying attention to them. Um, and you know, beyond that, I mean, the whole of the ascetic tradition. Father Tichon was talking about the uh, you know many people discussing what various spiritual fathers and mothers are are saying, and I don't know what the content of that is, but one of the real problems, uh, not just in terms of our attitude to war and violence, is that the this very developed science of the soul in the ascetic life is, is not generally taught to, to people uh, unless they happen, they happen to be families that are particularly close to monasteries. 
And similarly, another, you know, another, another thing that is very rarely discussed is how to act as a Christian in the world, not the sort of thing that, that churches should do or even theologians should do making statements, but particularly those of us in democratic countries where we can participate in politics easily, how do we use that Christianity, that, that uh, responsibility as Christians. In the, uh, some years ago in, in the Russian diocese uh, in Britain when Metropolitan Anthony was bishop, we had various study groups, one of which was a Christian in the secular world, um, chaired and I think uh, brought up by uh, Costa Caras, you know, Anglo-Greek, who was a, a member of the diocese, and actually a, a really remarkable example of somebody who, to the full, uh, took this responsibility of a conscientious Orthodox Christian fully involved with the world. Uh, but the, uh, I mean, the, the, you know, the, the last point is this enormous problem of tribalism extending into the diaspora. Both expatriates and converts run the risk of becoming caricatures of themselves in various ways. And one of the most pernicious ways is buying into the uh, political or church political divisions represented by their so-called mother churches. I mean, it, it actually seems to me that, you know, there is room for some respectful disobedience on the, on the part of the laity. Uh, and I'm thinking now of, you know, church problems of breaking communion rather than directly the war. Uh, you know, somebody has to say, we, we are not playing these games. And somebody, you know, the, the so-called mother churches will continue to hang on to their jurisdictions if, if they feel threatened and if they feel that it's only their own people, their own ethnic group or you know, ideological group who care about them. Uh, you know, I, I was listening with interest and also certain horror to the, the last discussion about fratricidal war as a propaganda phrase and you know i absolutely i i take your word for it that that's how it's used but that is an appalling thing if because well in one sense any war is fratricidal because humans are brothers but quintessentially to me you know a, a war between orthodox christians is fratricidal and it shouldn't matter one bit uh, you know, what ethnicity jurisdiction they are. Um, you know, it's, 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 it's very easy. I mean, humans are herd animals and it's very easy as lay people to, to buy into this um, and individually it, it may not make much difference if we don't but simply keeping lines of communication open, you know, refusing to divide either, you know, sides in the war or sides in church conflicts into us and them, that in fact, I, I think is something very valuable that uh, we, you know, we can all do. Thank you so much, Mr. Martin. I should have said Elizabeth Deocrit, an associate Sorry. lecturer at the Institute for Orthodox Christian Studies, Cambridge. So she came all the way from Cambridge. Thank you so much. Um, and last but not least, certainly Father Dragush Perescu, principal of the Institute for Orthodox Christian Studies in Cambridge. Father, the floor is yours and apologies to have you wait for so long. Thank you for your patience. Um, no, it's absolutely fine. Um, in a sense, I have the benefit of having listened to everyone, and I feel like um, I have very little to contribute now. Um, but I, I, um, I did, I did think of three things I wanted to say, and I will say them because I did think of them. 
and I wrote something down. So um, I can't. I have to get them out of my system. Um, otherwise, they'll stay there until the next time we have a conference. So um, the first thing I wanted to 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 address, and it resonates with with things that um, the other um, discussants have um, picked up on, is um, this question of what justifies war. Because it seems to me um, that this this uh, war in Ukraine, um, which actually started in twenty. 14 um, with Crimea is 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 the first uh, orthodox orthodox endorsed war of the 21st century. You know, since, I mean, we, we we've had different conflicts in the 20th century and uh, towards the end and and so on in in Serbia and and all the rest. But uh, this is the first 21st century um, conflict which um, very openly has this orthodox theological underpinning. And this is a, a troubling um, and a sobering um, realization. Um, so what justifies war, um, in a sense, is there such a thing as just war? I mean, we have this just war theory and the Russian Orthodox Church in, in their catechism draft of 2017, they kind of did dedicate a section to it. Um, and again, I think wrongly, they twist several things, they cherry pick elements of the just war theory from, from kind of the Western theology and uh, also kind of twist some of the narrative in, in, um, in the becoming of the, of the Orthodox uh, Church um, in, in Russia. But that's not, um, this is not the time to, to develop that. But the idea that war can be justified, um, um, I think is is troublesome, and and I don't think it has traction in the Orthodox Church. I mean, possibly um, um, defensive um, war, which which is never considered necessarily war. Um, but um, the, the point I, I hear here to make, in a sense, is that even just war theory, even if you think that a war is justified, this theory is there to um, keep a check and keep balances, and to, in a sense. Um, hold um, accountable um, those who are involved in war and to hold account accountable the terms in which the, um, a, a war is, is waged. And I feel that this is not happening um, at all um, here in the uh, Ukraine um, situation. Um, the other question that I had in mind was uh, this issue of pacifism. I mean, it, it was brought up by Irina, it was brought up by uh, um, Nathaniel and, and, um, and so on. So um, uh, pacifism, um, um, can we, I mean, pacifism when faced with actions such as um, those perpetrated by, by Russia, um, I mean, is there any place for it? Um, what does it mean to seek peace and reconciliation? Um, and I think peace and reconciliation in this context that we are now, um, I mean, theologically requires, and I think it only comes through a sacrifice. Um, and again, this idea that we need to redevelop or revisit this idea of the of theology of the cross and link it with um, whatever political theology the Orthodox Church um, uh, manifests in, in various contexts. Um, again, I think it's it's a very um, um, potent idea that that I hope theologians will will take up. Um, but um, I think peace requires justice. You cannot have peace without justice. Um, when you see it now in the way that negotiations have kind of stalled between the Ukrainians and the Russians because they feel that there is a great deal of injustice that has happened in Ukraine and how communities were butchered and, and, and so on. Um, but human justice and divine justice are not always identical, um, but they overlap in many aspects. Um, I think Christian justice and peace uh, includes and predicated on at least three things, which is prophetic message, um, speaking truth to power and prioritizing humanity as the icon of God in this world. And also um, is predicated on this prophetic, sacrificial, sometimes risky action on behalf of the weak and of the oppressed. Um, so pacifism as neutrality or passivity or, you know, thoughts and prayers, as, as some people say, I think has no place um, in Christianity. Um, it, it, it requires some form of action. So I think the action that is required is the pacifism of Christ-like witness and sacrifice. And we have these examples, I suppose, of from St. John Chrysostom, who always stood on the side of those who were oppressed and, and um, on the margins to St. Maria Skoptova, for example, in the 20th century. She 
again fought against injustice and and during a time of war but she did that did this kind of christ-like pacifism and the the last thing is um which is related to this is i think this idea of witness and discipleship um because um i think what sadly what this situation in ukraine and this whole war has um has kind of i think pulled the the, the cloth of many people's eyes I mean, certainly um, off of my eyes, is that um, something that's very hard to accept for us as Orthodox, that we as Orthodox today have forgotten, have really forgotten the cost of being disciples of Christ um, in this world. We have forgotten that it comes with a price. Um, and, and in doing so, we have become very resistant to paying that price of discipleship and of witness um, to Christ. Um, and um, we have kind of buried that cost, cost of discipleship under ritual, under tradition, under ethno-religiosity, uh, causing up to political power. And uh, we have equated the cost of discipleship with um, sometimes defending the fatherland, as um, Alison was mentioning there, or this type of ideology, or theologically with defending the fathers or following the fathers and so on, um, and sneering openly at, um, um, anything that's possibly ecumenical or um, um, anything that's that's part of the modern world in terms of how society develops. So um, I think, I hope one of the developments in, in terms of, of our theological awareness um, in the Orthodox Church will be that people will, will revisit the idea of what it means to, to be a disciple of Christ, to witness to Christ as individuals, as communities, and as, as, as church. Um, and the Orthodox are witnessing in a very divided um, anti-mission way, in, to, to put it uh, mildly. Um, so, um, yeah, this is what I wanted to, to say. Thank you very much. Uh, that was, I've, I've taken notes. Um, I think I'll give Irina a chance to respond because she, there was a question for Irina by Alison. Uh, and then whoever wants to have a second round, uh, reflect a bit while uh, Irina answers Alison's question and, and open it to the audience. Yeah, exactly. sure. Whoever were here, uh, whoever has thoughts and hasn't spoken, those the speakers as well. So Irina, the word, the, the floor is yours. I will, I will just reply uh, briefly because um, this uh, um, rise of patriotic education, which uh, Alison has observed, uh, is absolutely overwhelming uh, in uh, in Russia, and this is not um, the case in, in Estonia where I live. But I can see from the um, you know conversations and studies and, and research that it is uh, it's been happening for already. I would say one and a half decades at least, and the well to, to be to be fair we could say that you know there are similar forms of certain forms of patriotic education in ukraine uh like for example the Parosh siege you know this uh, uh cossacks you know there is a very strong uh, kind of um uh part of this in in this kind of national um, imaginary <laughs> and i've heard about young people being very actively involved in various martial arts in this cossack um, um, settings and so i don't know much about this but i think there might, might be similar uh, things happening but when we speak about russia I can i can see that there is also uh very strong cult of the victory in the Second World War, and perhaps the patriotic education connected with the cult of, of, of the victory um, creates a very, um, very dangerous uh, combination. And um, there are certain, you know, you know, we could call it a like rise of militancy. Um, uh, in some forms uh, that reminds, you know, the 1930s and because um, youth in the 1930s and, you know, all over Europe was very much involved in various 
kind of mil militant uh, um, camps and you know forms of activity. So I would say that yeah, uh, a certain um, problem there. <laughs> but uh, um, I guess yes, the young people they 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 are one of these groups that can be influenced uh, quite easily, and that depends on on the um, settings in which they are. I don't know if this is the answer, but it's certainly um, a, a worrying tendency. And obviously, with, in the context of the current war, it it appears as 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 a very uh, wrong direction that the the Orthodox parishes um, who organized such camps were taken, and and this is um, unfortunately is is the case. Uh, shall I invite um, the audience, people who have been here to share, raise thoughts? Chrisida, I think you have to Well, I, I actually think I should potentially hold off because my perspective is an Ethiopian perspective. But just to say that there is a really good opportunity here for um, different um, populations to find a route to peace through their faith. And the fact that the co-religionists are fighting each other, I believe is untenable. And uh, eventually, whether it's, you know, I think it will, it will speed us towards peaceful resolution. The fact that, both of these wars, one civil, although it's not, neither of them, neither of them are, are described as wars by, 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 by the states, by, by the Ethiopian state. It, it began at least as a special operation uh, based on, on, on a legal, on, on, on a legal issue, but also um, a, a violent, a threat of violence. And, um, uh, and so they saw it as a defensive, a defensive uh, operation. And for the Russians, uh, it is um, uh, <clears throat> as it's been filtered through the Western press, is also described as a special operation. Now, I have followed the war, uh, the conflict in Ethiopia, incredibly carefully, picking up on the internet absolutely like a magpie, as many different um uh reports etc on on the situation uh where um tigray the north of, of ethiopia uh is, is 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 blockaded and is it is, is, is there's a blackout um <clears throat> but um so we're not really sure quite the extent of the fratricide but there are human rights reports uh, uh, we know that horrific things have been perpetrated by orthodox, orthodox against orthodox, but of course there are also Muslims involved, which, which means that it is uh, not in any way, shape or form a holy war. It is based on national disagreements of the idea of what it is to be Ethiopian, and on the recalcitrance of the former regime and these faltering steps towards a commission for, uh, for peaceful resolution, which is being formed in Ethiopia today. What I want to say is, finally, is that the view from afar, whether it's the view of what's happening in Ukraine and Russia or of Ethiopia, has been said to be based on some sort of racial uh, 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 prejudice against Africa. And I would say no. I would say, as an Africanist, I would say there is a, 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 a fatigue about conflicts in Africa. And that the Ukrainian situation is so much more a pivotal moment in in global geopolitics, that the, the reason the reasons behind 
the the immediacy of the uh, of the reporting in Ukraine uh, is partly because it speaks to to the whole world in a way that the Ethiopian crisis doesn't. Um, yes, there's a blackout in Ethiopia, but we are in a completely different age where things are being recorded on people's telephones. And um, just to say finally that in my magpie occupation of following the war as closely as I possibly can, it has amazed me how um, a, a terrible massacre in deep rural Ethiopia in my region, Amhara region, which is just the neighboring region, region which is also majority Orthodox um, from Tigray, the way it can be it can be reported the day after with, with interviews of locals, local peasants, you know, who, who may or may not be literate. It's just we are, we are in a completely different age of the way that we can zoom in on rape as a weapon of war, whether it's in Ukraine or whether it's in Ethiopia. Um, and so uh, I, I feel that um, uh, the, the fact that there is uh, the threat of a kind of um, uh, ideology of a holy war in, 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 in the Ukrainian-Russian uh, context is very different from the Ethiopian context, which is really is a political, a, a political complex. Um, Thank you. Yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yes, actually, well, um, precisely uh, what, uh, in my um, personal view, what just Cressida said about Ethiopia can be really said about this conflict as well. So I am not, um, I, I don't agree with those, um, well, who, well, the not the ones mentioned that, well, uh, that it's presented the Holy War, it is justified, the orthodoxy justifies the war, or Russian orthodoxy justifies the war. No, it doesn't. And I want to emphasize once again, uh, coming back to my presentation, when I um, showed the website of the main think tank of uh, those who are behind the ideology of the Russian world. And they are not just uh, only the Orthodox there, uh, they're Muslims, they're atheists, they're all sorts of people who are united and who are creating, promoting their ideology, not theology, ideology, political ideology and political purposes. And the uh, Orthodoxy and the theology and the church. Um, has been instrument, uh, instrumentalized, has been used um, by those. So we need to really divide um, the church and true Orthodox theology from that which is possibly presented as uh, the teaching of the churches. So, um, and uh, really what we see, just uh, openly see on the website, those who, well, who support um, the, 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 the war from the Russian side. Uh, well, there are Orthodox people there, and many, but um, the ideology is not Orthodox at all. It's a Soviet, um, well, uh, Stalinist um, thing which adopted certain points uh, or from um, the, um, the Orthodox crowds that were, you know, the, Uh, something happened. Russian world intervention. Russian yeah. uh, apologies. We, we lost you for a second. I, I, I think I think you got an answer. Oh, uh, yes, uh, hand raised. <laughs> <laughs> so, so apologies, we lost you for a minute. Uh, it, we continue where we left it. I, I think Father uh, Tihon was essentially saying that there are multiple ideologies at play, and you know, Orthodox theology is really one of the under, under layers for some for some uh, actors, but there's multiple other actors in the play field. Uh, Andre, I think you wanted to make a contribution. Yes, I would like to, uh, to say that, uh, in my view, uh, it is a great mistake uh, to uh, call uh, this war uh, some kind of uh, religious war or uh, first uh, inter-Orthodox war of the 21st century. 
because uh, you should understand that Russia uh, is a very secular uh, country uh, with uh, maybe five, um, not, not more than 10% of uh, Orthodox practitioners and uh, with a very, uh, very small influence of the Russian Orthodox Church on the uh, politics. Um, and uh, uh, all, all the uh, words about justification of this war, uh, they are not uh, religious. If you, uh, if you uh, will try to analyze, uh, for example, uh, propaganda discourse in the Russian media, uh, they um, uh, doesn't use, uh, for example, uh, the discourse of holy war. Uh, maybe some someone uh, arbitrary uh, mention uh, these uh, words, but uh, it is not a discourse uh, of uh, propaganda. Um, they used uh, something uh, another, the discourse of denazification, and and, and so on. And uh, you, and you should uh, understand it. Uh, and uh, I I think that we uh, we shouldn't uh, make uh, this mistake uh, because uh, um, uh, the influence of Russian Orthodox Church on on this um, uh, is very small. Uh, uh, on the other hand, uh, uh, I I heard the father. T uh, Tihon, who, uh, who tried to make uh, Russian Orthodox uh, people white, uh, but, uh, but not. Um, a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, priests, a lot of uh, bishops, uh, a lot of uh, common believers of the Russian Orthodox Church in Russia and outside Russia uh, support, uh, support this war. Uh, and, uh, and uh, support uh, uh, ideologically, support uh, their prayers, and, and so on. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, of course, a significant part of uh, Russian Orthodox Church uh, uh, is against uh, the war, but we don't know uh, how much, uh, how, how much the, this number of, uh, of people because they uh, they are hidden uh, uh, they uh, are silent uh, and, and so on mm -hmm. that's uh, i would like to add thank you andre yes, yes lars yes. Uh, i can i can take you back a hundred and um 120 years roughly in time and uh, transport you to western europe central europe as well when the same uh, conversation was um, actually not taking place, but uh, after, after the First World War, it did take place, namely between the different um, Protestant countries in Europe, where uh, a very, <laughs> where, where a very uh, similar mixture of romantic nationalism and militarism and a distorted view of uh, Christianity, but Protestant Christianity was being used in order to mobilize populations against each other. And the question was, now I can't remember who said it, but uh, the, the impact of uh, Alison, yeah, it was you. Um, so uh, what, what is the impact, the long-term impact of um, indoctrination on the youth when they have to, um, when they incorporate um, essentially uh, preparation for war uh, in, into their own uh, religious and, um, uh, well, uh, educational uh, upbringing. Well, um, the, a little bit of optimism is that after the First World War, this was completely destroyed with the notable exception of uh, those countries that were so ruined by the war that they, uh, that they became the playground for um, very radical ideologies, uh, thinking of Germany, for example, but also Romania, uh, places that are very, um, uh, very clear examples where, where radicalization can lead to. But um, 
but but it does not it does not necessarily mean that a whole generation is now predestined to go into war um, because the children they have their own mechanism of of dealing with um, messages that come from above they're being ignored um, yes I am speaking as a teacher and as the father of two children who are at school uh, they know precisely what comes from the teachers they know how to manipulate this in their own ways so um and of course they have their friends so this the, the, uh, the, there is not no um necessity for a uh, a very negative uh, trajectory where this can move but of course uh, my example that i mentioned led to the first world war and that was not a that, that has been described as a fratricide war as well um so we have to keep this in mind as well Thank you, Lars. A very important point is, uh, is the trauma of war. The, the trauma, people will process it and heal in part, but if it's unaddressed, it will, it will remain and divide people. So I think it's about, um, you know, the future really is not just about the moment today and the loss of life. It's what kind of future can we imagine as an Orthodox community for the future if we are, will allow these divisions to uh, to define us. And I think um, Elizabeth made a really important point about uh, respectful disobedience. I think this is, I was just having a conversation with one of um, the members of the audience earlier that uh, what is the role of the laity? And I think everyone touched on that. What is the role of the clergy on the ground, the laity, the theologians who don't have uh, decision-making power within the religious matters? What is our role? Um, Shall we be, uh, go back to you know uh, reminding ourselves what discipleship means within Orthodox faith? Um, shall is asceticism perhaps a direction? So so perhaps this is actually a, a moment for us to understand um, what we stand for as Orthodox practitioners, and then use that as Elizabeth said as an opportunity within the world. Uh, because I think Father Dragos uh, really referred to, to the worldliness. We've become worldly, as the Ethiopians like to say, Alamawi. We became worldly. Uh, and the question is, uh, is, it, is there another way of being Orthodox in the world within today's world? So I won't monopolize. I think someone Julie. Uh, yes. Yuri, yeah. is that the name? Uh, yeah. Just two quick points. Uh, I think what emerges from the last exchanges is also the need for some concrete uh, work on. Uh, tracking down attempts of the Moscow Patriarchate to come close to the definition of just war theory since 2000 when they published the social doctrine of the Russian Orthodox Church. And there have been some pronouncements which have been following on that. In that document, they even used Augustine as a framework for that thing, but it was not a complete sort of formulation. Uh, so then we can see how this may have been used, exploited, countered in the current sort of polemical exchanges between the Russian and the Ukrainian clerical circles who've been working on that. And the second uh, thing which emerges, I think the second interesting point that emerges from the discussion is, uh, uh, as far as I remember, the Serbian Orthodox Church was caught in the same just war trap to which one can add sort of the Balkan Reconquista just war theory within which framework the Balkan Orthodox Church is often a function since the late 19th century. In this case, I have to say, though it was exploited to some extent by the leadership of the church and some theologians, after the war, maybe what uh, Natalia would suggest that happened, circles in the Orthodox Church revisited that sort of exploitation of orthodoxy for that new sort of version of Reconquista warfare, shall we say, and came out with a return to the patristic views. So on a smaller scale, this, this has also already happened within, as I said, the Balkan Orthodox. So it will be really interesting to see whether that kind of uh, development tendency uh, may also evolve along the lines that Natanya Wood and Andrei could suggested. So that's what they take from the discussion. Uh, I think Natalia or Irina, Irina, I think it was Irina, right? Or, or Alison. Do we uh, have a Natana? Oh, Natana, sorry, you said Natana. Did you say? Natana, right? Yeah. So you, okay, sorry, I thought you said Natalia. We don't have a no, no. discussion. Uh, yes, but um, yes. So, Natalia, do you want to 
I wonder if you've heard the, that comment. Uh, I, I, I kind of heard it. I, I have to admit my audio is, is not the best. Um, so I was, did, was there a question that I didn't hear or? Would you like to come here and, and make a uh, comment? Uh, can you hear me now? I, I, yeah, I think I can hear you now. Okay. Yeah. I was just saying that a similar, uh, how to put it, a reassessment of the use of uh, war ideologies within Orthodox context has already happened in the Serbian Orthodox Church following the wars of Yugoslav succession, uh, which was followed by, as I said, reassessment of this uh, uh, use of just war theory on the basis of return to the patristic sort of attitudes to war and peace. So it will be interesting to see whether something which has already has happened on a smaller scale can now happen on a, on a larger scale since obviously international orthodoxy is undergoing earthquake sort of of some proportions currently. Yes, no, uh, that, yeah, that's a, a very good question. Um, I admit, I don't really know um, a great deal about those developments in the Serbian Orthodox Church. Serbian Orthodoxy is one of my weaknesses. I mostly focus on the Russian and Greek traditions, but um, uh, yeah, that, that's actually, um, thank you for pointing me towards that. I, I would like to look at the Serbian tradition more and yes, it would be very interesting to see uh, if similar things would develop in Ukrainian tradition. Um, I would just say uh, about the Ukrainian tradition, I think um, to bring it back to uh, Andre's original comments about contextual theology, right? I mean, something that does happen in the Ukrainian tradition is going to have to be different from how it might've happened in Serbia, um, but um, part of the, the theology of the cross uh, that I had mentioned uh, in my first comment is, uh, you know, a parallel to that idea is this idea of, of theology from the cross. So theology from the perspective of those who have undergone these experiences of war and devastation. Um, so that, that theology from the cross became, of course, a, a, a idea that fed into liberation theology. So it would be interesting for me to see if um, if in the Ukrainian theological tradition we do get you know a, the development of a of a strong theology from the cross, a, an orthodox kind of liberation theology uh, from out of that tradition and out of these experiences. And if so, I think um, that's definitely something that global orthodox theology should want to elevate and bring to the forefront of our conversations um, move, you know, moving forward. Thank you, Andre. We ran out of time. I just realized we have been so lost <laughs> in the <laughs> conversation. I, I, looked, I looked at the clock <laughs> and I thought, uh, should I say something? But this is such a beautiful circle that I didn't um, want to. It, it turned yes. out into another private session. So yeah, exactly. Yes. <laughs> and uh, thank you. Uh, uh, before uh, before you say the, before you close the session, I would just like to thank you once again and you in the distance uh, from America to to uh, deepest Russia. <laughs> to, um, uh, thank you very much for participating um, uh, and you from the near <laughs> circle <laughs> um, because um, uh, this is a very, if you just leave these discussions to politicians or to the media, you don't get anywhere. It's, um, they, they will go for the most uh, eye-catching uh, uh, and, um, well, um, for, for, for the images that uh, make uh, news of the day, and then they will be forgotten. What you say, the fatigue of uh, the, the war in, uh, in Ethiopia, um, why is it so much in, is this uh, conflict so much in the focus because it's in europe uh, let's face it and uh, uh, if, if uh, historically it's of course a different matter because if you study the history of europe it is a history of warfare there is not uh, there in every corner and um, that, that's why you know an institution like the european union is such a wonderful thing because it actually is abolishes war but um uh, this brings 
it back into the limelight and it shows where, where the uh, where conflicts can actually lead and fratricidal yes in many ways yes uh, you, you mentioned uh, africa and uh, europe yes yeah. but i mean the this uh, religious conflict uh, in iraq in 2004 yes. in 2008 where uh, not just uh, uh, the same sex of islam she answered this for each other they killed each other but I think the, minor, the Christian minorities, yeah. they weren't minorities, they were the original people of uh, yeah. Iraq, Lebanon, were the victims of that conflict. Yeah. Absolutely. So Absolutely. Sort of yeah. Sort of like uh, they saw them as, uh, they're not Muslims, they are unbelievers. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm getting, of course, that the Christianity was much earlier than Islam. Yeah. 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 I, I, I mean, yeah, because, and you mentioned rightly. But because the Ukraine and Russia is in Europe, obviously in the continent. So these small conflicts in Ethiopia and the like seem to catch the, a bit of the news in the media and then disappears. Yeah. Yeah. So, and then, 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 yes. And then you have the state government media, in like in Russia, so at the moment, uh, uh, which is. Uh, of course, uh, turning its attention into, uh, you know, to, to the war, to the conflict uh, as, uh, as something to serve its own purposes. So, so where, wherever you look, it's, you get the distorted view. So this is why I really, really, uh, you know, wanted to say thank you to, for, for coming and for contributing. This is uh, something I will never forget. This is a very uh, moving experience. So thank you also for you in the distance. <laughs> I will see you again um, at, at one of our uh, occasions. Yes. Yes. Thank you. And, and, thank, and, and thank you to well, Romina to thank you. for, tra for <laughs> traveling all the way to come here for, for this occasion. Yes. It's a, it's a blessing and I'm learning. I, I'm not based in Russian Orthodoxy, so I, it's, it's a learning to me. Uh, and I think for, for us, really, the vision is to create an educational platform. We have so much to learn from each other. Uh, we, we, I think there are these imaginary constructed divisions, uh, but when we actually try to see each other at a human level and really understand that uh, there might be a reason behind our rationalizations, but if we start to understand that reason, perhaps we'll find a common ground to start dialogue. So, Really, for us is to create, you know, a, a platform for education and sharing, and we'll see with Lars if we can produce something subsequently, maybe some keynotes from the conversations uh, to, you know, to exist along with this video, and then the video will be uh, on the YouTube uh, channel, um, and and the speakers and discussants will have an opportunity to review the video as well prior to. Uh, its dissemination. So thank you all so much. Thank you to all for coming. Uh, it's been a pleasure, and apologies for going over time. Thank you. Thank you to our digital participants. So I'm going to stop the recording now. Uh, Thank you.